Welcome to POTUS 2016, where we call the presidential horse race and pour cold hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Another surprise in a surprising year. Donald Trump went to Mexico, a country he has berated throughout his campaign, to meet with President Enrique Peña Nieto, who's compared Trump's populism to Hitler's and Mussolini's. We'll dig into that. And a bit of a surprise, too, Hillary Clinton emerged from late summer fundraisers to address the American Legion's convention in Cincinnati, this to promote American exceptionalism. My opponent misses something important. When we say America is exceptional, it doesn't mean that people from other places don't feel deep national pride just like we do. It means that we recognize America's unique and unparalleled ability to be a force for peace and progress, a champion for freedom and opportunity. Our power comes with a responsibility to lead, humbly, thoughtfully, and with a fierce commitment to our values. Because when America fails to lead, we leave a vacuum that either causes chaos or other countries or networks rush in to fill the void. So no matter how hard it gets, no matter how great the challenge, America must lead. Note that Clinton said Donald Trump doesn't believe in American exceptionalism. She likely knows this from what he said at a Texas Tea Party forum in 2015 before Trump announced his candidacy. Define American exceptionalism. Does American exceptionalism still exist? And uh, what do we do to grow American exceptionalism? Okay, well, I don't like the term. I'll be honest with you. And I'll, people will say, oh, he's not patriotic. Look, if I'm a Russian, or if I'm a German, or if I'm a person we do business with, why, you know, I don't think it's a very nice term. We're exceptional, you're not. First of all, Germany's eating our lunch. So they say, why are you exceptional? We're doing a lot better than you. Put another way, let's make America exceptional again, or maybe not. We'll discuss Trump, Hillary, and immigration today. Also on our agenda, the new diverse electorate, the Clinton fall strategy. Plus, in our evidence-based politics segment, government ethics, if that's not an oxymoron, how might the existing laws and regulations apply to possible conflicts of interest regarding the Clinton Foundation and Trump's debts? But first, is it still Hillary by a length? Not quite. Yes, time for the horse race. Less than 10 weeks to go until Election Day. Hillary Clinton's convention bounce is officially over. This narrowing of the numbers can also be read as the unofficial beginning of the final campaign run. Hillary still leads Trump nationally by about five percentage points, according to Real Clear Politics aggregated polling data. And she may want to focus more on appealing to independents after factoring in support for third party candidates Gary Johnson and Jill Stein, Clinton's lead slips to about four and a half percentage points. On the electoral map, state polling shows little change in recent weeks, which may be more a reflection of the lack of state polling data available. We look forward to a ramp up in polling during the month of September. And while Clinton may be slipping a little in her lead, she appears to have slipped in popularity in August, too. According to polling results from ABC News and The Washington Post released Wednesday, Clinton's unfavorable ratings among all adults is that dotted line on the top there has risen by six percentage points over the past three weeks. That's her unfavorable rating. Among registered voters who were surveyed, both candidates are now equally unpopular at a whopping 60 percent. Hillary remained largely out of the limelight in August as news about her use of a private email server and alleged conflicts of interest continue to make headlines. All right, let's discuss all this. Joining us, senior writer for 538, novelist and cultural analyst Farai Shadea. Also here, reporter Annie Carney, who's been covering Hillary Clinton for Politico and via Skype. Maria Inahosa, founder of the Futuro Media Group. She's been researching the growing minority electorate for an upcoming PBS special, The New Deciders. Maria is also the host of Latino USA on public radio. Hello, all three of you. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Brian. 
Hey, Brian. So, so suddenly after not doing it at all during the campaign, Donald Trump seems to want to be seen in the context of black and Latino people. Uh, in Mexico Wednesday, in Detroit Saturday. Fry, what's going on? Well, basically, it is very much about appealing to white swing voters. There's a, a political scientist that I've spoken with named Paul Freimer, Freimer, who calls black voters in particular, but certainly other demographic groups fall into this as well, captured groups because essentially one party has dominated their vote and sometimes been able to take them for granted and the other party has ignored them. For many historic reasons, this dates all the way back to Reconstruction when black people first got the, the, the right to vote. There was a, an effort to contain black political power. I won't go into all the history. You can look his work up yourself. But basically, black people and Latinos and many other groups are used symbolically. Um, so it's like, I'm not a racist. How could I be racist? My friend Mark Burns is a black pastor. Mark Burns is the pastor who spoke at the Republican convention, who then tweeted out a picture of Hillary Clinton in blackface and had to apologize for it. So I wouldn't say he exactly speaks for black America. I don't think any one black person can, but you get the picture. Do you know what I mean? I do. Maria, same question. So it's interesting, Brian, because um, I actually talked a lot about the possibility that Donald Trump would use the African-American community um, and his actually anti-Mexican uh, attacks to say to African-American voters, come and vote for me because of this. Obviously, that's not where his politic went. But when you think about what he's doing now, I think black and Latino voters are actually standing back and saying, well, this is really fascinating, exactly what's going on here. On Latino USA, we have a segment called Hispandering. Um, that we actually use comics to talk about this, but this couldn't be a clearer form of Donald Trump um, attempting to expander. Um, it's fascinating, that all of the talk, at least in terms of Mexico, is what is going on in terms of Peña Nieto asking uh, both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump to come down to Los Pinos to have a meeting. So um, I, I think that if I was Donald Trump, and this is what, what I was thinking, would Donald Trump actually be able to vote for Donald Trump, the candidate now, according to what he's going to say tonight? I'm assuming there's going to be some kind of, you know, we're going to build a wall, but there's going to be a door. There's going to be a key. Somebody's going to know you're going to have to answer the right three questions, whatever. But in some way, he's going to have to be stepping back. And so the Donald Trump is actually, would you vote for that candidate after what you have criticized as saying, you know, you'll never go back? And We'll, we'll see what happens now. Trump once said his supporters are so loyal he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue in New York and his supporters would still support him. I heard some, somebody say, well, he took his immigration policy onto Fifth Avenue and shot it. So we'll <laughs> see if, uh, for, uh, if his supporters still stay with him when he muddles up what was his defining issue. Yeah, I just want to speak to one thing that Maria said about um, triangulating the black and Latino votes, because there have sometimes been these efforts to say, well, black people are competing with Latinos, and the reality is everyone competes with everyone in America. But right now, Donald Trump's favorability rating with African Americans is zero, according to some polls, and he's in fourth place behind the two third-party candidates, so it's not working so far. Annie, has Hillary Clinton accepted an invitation to go meet with the Mexican president? She's not. Know? She she declined that invitation. She declined yes. the invitation? Yes. Why would she do that? Um, well, first of all, I've actually talked a lot to her campaign about it. will she take a foreign trip during this election? Does she need to? And I think that the thinking is no. She Her time is better spent in battleground states here. She doesn't have to go abroad to prove her uh, foreign um, national security bona fides or that she knows about international issues. She was the Secretary of State. Another issue is that, you know, there's not a lot of great places in the world. Like Israel's a complicated place for the Democratic Party right now. Um, Europe's a bit of a mess. Um, like Brexit is not, I mean, where would she actually go that it would right. be like a clean win for her? And she doesn't need it. Um, so I think that 
there has been no plans for her to go abroad. And what I heard saw interesting, she, but she's yeah. been trying to really build up her Latino vote. I think yes. her position on immigration is unambiguously path to citizenship, yeah. not just path to legalization. Mm -hmm. uh, she doesn't talk at all about border security. It used to be talking about a balance in the mm -hmm. Democratic Party, including a path to citizenship. Mm -hmm. So it seems she's really trying to go for big, big numbers in that group. So it could help in theory, to build up that base I think, by going to Mexico, too. Sure, but I don't think, I mean, I haven't, a lot of the things you're talking about are, are issues that she hasn't highlighted so much since the primary. Mm -hmm. I mean, she hasn't backed off of those pledges, but in recent weeks, it's been more about expanding the map. It's been a big push for Republicans for Hillary. Um, it's been appealing to voters who have voted Romney or McCain in past elections. So I, I think that maybe, I don't know, looking at their numbers, they think that Trump is doing so badly with this group, they don't need to do that right now. So, Maria, is Hillary Clinton taking Latinos too much for granted now? She's de-emphasizing this issue during, uh, you know, the post-primary season? You know, she did decline the invitation. You know, will she change her mind? I don't know. Um, I understand that she has nothing to prove in terms of her international cred. But um, I think we, you know, a lot will depend on what happened, what's the, the outcome of the Donald Trump Enrique Peña Nieto meeting. Um, there is a sentiment I have heard um, from critics that, you know, perhaps Hillary Clinton is not putting enough emphasis on the Latino vote, um, that she's going broad um, and that she's looking at, you know, at those, at those particular states that she needs to swing. Of course, in all of those, the either slim or just a little bit bigger than slim margins, oftentimes Latinos will be those voters. Right. And it could be a difference between getting, you know, 65% uh, of Latino vote or 70% of Latino vote in a particular state that swings the state. True, true. But at the same time, Hillary Clinton, the candidate, is in a difficult position. Um, she is being watched by Latino media and activists like a hawk. Um, any misstep, Anything that she says that um, might be perceived as his pandering, really mm. people are on her mm -hmm. immediately. So I think she's trying to figure what is the right way to really connect with the Latino community. And given everything that's going on, is that really going to be the priority when right now it looks like those numbers are solid? You know, again, is Donald Trump going to be able to move any Latino numbers after going to Mexico? Um, I think that is yet to be seen but I will tell you this, Brian, um, I'm kind of surprised at the people that I'm encountering who are Donald Trump supporters and who are Latinos. Mm -hmm. um, so I am not, I mean, they are there. Um, they are listening to him. Many of them, uh, including um, the head of the Libre Initiative, um, have said that they have wanted to hear Donald Trump soften and um, maybe even apologize. So. Um, it would be a situation, wouldn't it, if it looked as if Donald Trump was trying to go after this vote and yeah, that Hillary Clinton yeah, was not. Go ahead. Just another point of like what we're missing about Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton Latino voters is um, the surrogates she's going to have after Labor Day. Like Barack Obama uh, is going to hit the trail. He's um, doing t at least 12 events in battleground states between now and November. Uh, he's going to be counted on for a lot of get out the vote with black and Latino voters. That's, he's not going to be, that's going to be the focus of his efforts, and that's a huge boost for her. How about that speech clip that we played from her American Legion speech in Cincinnati saying, I'm for American exceptionalism mm -hmm. and Donald Trump isn't? And there was that Donald Trump clip from last year, which indicated yeah. that he doesn't like the term. But how do you see this? Is this, she's trying to flip the script. Is this a liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican role reversal where she's trying to come off as the bigger sort of global patriot? Well... I've been seeing this since the convention. I think she really seized on how doom and gloom the Republican convention was, how dark a portrait it painted of our country. And the Democratic convention was um, patriotic. They had flags on the, like, um, people were waving American flags, which I think we talked about on your radio show once, yeah. was, is like you think of those rah-rah USA chants as something you see in the Republican Party, not the Democratic and Party. And that's the contrast with Make America Great right. Again, suggesting that America isn't great today. All, all through to the Olympics, which I, um, Hillary Clinton highlighted the athletes, tweeted about them. It was Donald oh. Trump literally didn't 
pretended it didn't happen. Yeah. So I think the idea of exceptionalism in sports even runs against. So, so for I, I guess she assumes there's no backlash that's big enough to hurt her among people who think, ah, oh, this American exceptionalism is so jingoistic, um, which you know a lot of progressives do in kind of the way that Trump was explaining it, like, oh, well, who are we to go out and say our country is so much better than yours? even when Germany is eating our lunch economically, for example. But I guess there aren't enough progressives who think like that in the world or in the country who are going to vote to make this a losing strategy for her. Well, first of all, she was speaking to a veteran's audience. So, so these remarks, although everything goes global, were targeted. But I think that it's also no surprise that, that Hillary Clinton has been um, painted by her opponents and even by some of her friends as more hawkish than a lot of Democrats. I mean, she is more of a military interventionist than a lot of, um, you know, her, you know, certainly than, than Bernie Sanders. I mean, that, that's almost silly to say, but it's worth mentioning. So if you're a Sanders supporter who's bothered by that, you were already bothered by it, and this is not news to you. So again, I don't think it really shakes anything up. I know you and Maria are doing some similar kinds of reporting. You're looking at the American electorate mm -hmm. as a whole and telling stories that go with some of the data that 538 puts out. Maria, I know you're uh, doing the new Decider series uh, or special for PBS. Farai, what have you learned that we don't know? Well, the first group we actually, uh, next week, the first group we look at is uh, military families and veterans. And so generally, uh, there's about a 20 percentage point gap between how America votes and how veterans vote in favor of Republicans. And that still exists, but it shrunk to about half of its size, according to recent polls. So Trump is ahead with veterans, but not with black veterans, not with Latino veterans. And so we're seeing some, you know, because a lot of it is about this intersectionality. So, you know, you can say this is what veterans think, but not all veterans are the same. And, and I think that veterans in some swing states, like particularly Florida and Virginia, are sizable uh, proportions of key districts in the state. And so what's interesting is that in Virginia, there's been some good statewide polling and veterans in Virginia prefer Clinton, um, even though veterans nationwide don't. So again, it's just like, it's, it's, it's the battleground of battlegrounds. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, start the music, rev your engines. Maria, tell us something we may not know. So we focused on what we believe are, are these groups that are not being focused on um, specifically in terms of the national electorate, but again, in terms of slivers of, um, of, of, voting, of voting blocks that could swing a state. These are the, the ones that could be what we call the new deciders. So, for example, Arab Americans or Muslim Americans in Ohio. As you know, Ohio decides the election has for the last 50 years. So um, in a tight race, these it's a small, it's about you know 2% or so. But what we noticed is that the Islamophobia that Muslim or Arab Americans, and of course we, we also spoke to Arab Christians, um, but the Islamophobia that they feel is actually motivating people to start registering, to actually start getting engaged in voting. So you're seeing voter registration um, at the mosques uh, like never before. Um, with Latino voters in Florida, we're looking at Latino evangelicals. Most people think Latino evangelicals must be Republican, must be conservative voters. Actually not. Um, Latino evangelicals are really hard to pigeonhole. And right. this particular group that we're focusing on is actually... Um, not mentioning his name, but very clearly anti-Trump. So um, the new deciders, PBS, is it next Tuesday? It will be, yes, next Tuesday after Frontline on PBS. So we're hoping everybody watches. Maria Hinojosa, thank you very much. Farai and Annie, stay with us as we bring on more evidence. Time for evidence-based politics, where we pour cold, hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. During her tenure as Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton met with hundreds of people. More than 80, according to the Associated Press, were donors to the Clinton Foundation. 
Did they, in effect, buy access to the Secretary of State? Clinton defenders argue that such meetings were comparatively few and there was never a quid pro quo. But just what is the legal standard to which high-level officials are held? An expert in government ethics law joins us via Skype. She is Kathleen Clark, professor of law at Washington University in St. Louis. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. There was a Supreme Court ruling on this just recently regarding the conviction of um, former Virginia Governor uh, Bob McDonnell, and they threw out a conviction. Is that, is that a good place to start? It's a, it's a perfectly good place to start because it tells you a little bit about what the state of ethics standards is in this country. What the Supreme Court did, it threw out the conviction of uh, former Virginia Governor McDonnell uh, because it said that merely arranging for meetings uh, with uh, someone outside of the government um, cannot, do, does not constitute an official act and so therefore cannot be the basis for a bribery uh, conviction. He would have had to have done something or somebody who he arranged a meeting with would have had to have done something that was a government favor for that person? Not exactly. He would have had to have the intention of pressuring that other government official uh, into taking action on behalf of uh, the, the, the private company. Uh -huh. And the government didn't prove that he had that added intention. So from what we know so far about the meetings that Clinton Foundation donors got uh, with people arranged by the State Department or in the State Department, is it, uh, does it go beyond that Supreme Court standard? Um, I've seen no indication that those meetings violated the bribery statute or any other ethics standards that currently exist. Andy Carney, covering Hillary Clinton closely as you do, there are really two questions to ask here. One is about the law. Mm -hmm. The other is about political ethics and not just right. perception, but what's kind of ethically wrong, even if it's not legally well, wrong. This seems to be the question with every Clinton scandal. It's like, by the, by the book, by the law, she didn't break the law. But is that, is that all that matters? Uh, I'd be, like, does, does it matter that it looks bad? Does it matter that it, it gives the impression that there was a open channel when the rules that she had put out forth with the White House when she took the job was that there would be a clear barrier between the foundation and her work at the State Department? So given that clearly there wasn't that barrier, or if there was a barrier, it had some holes in it or some lines of communication, um, and it wasn't quite what we thought it was, should, does that matter? Should she be held accountable to that? Is there another standard besides just saying black and white, she didn't break the law? Right. And Professor, um, are the standards that are in place, according to your perception and, you know, the studies that you do, sufficient? Well. They're relatively narrow in scope. There are things that they do not cover. Um, and one of the things that they don't cover is certain types of relationships, friendships. They don't prevent government officials from making decisions or partic participating in matters that may involve people to whom they might feel some debt of gratitude. That's what we're dealing with here, I think, with the Clinton Foundation, this question about whether Clinton's aides or she herself felt a debt of gratitude toward those individuals. And I would say that our current ethics standards don't address that, aren't, aren't really sufficient, aren't specific enough to address this particular situation. Farai, is that not the very nature of politics? Yeah, I mean, you know, that whole saying is that money is the mother's milk of politics. And so, um, as many people have, have started analyzing, essentially there is no there is no modern body politic without influence peddling of one form or another. And that's why you've seen ways that have circumvented the laws designed to prevent Congress people from becoming lobbyists. They just sort of take a, a minor time out and then become lobbyists and make, you know, easily 10 times as much as they made on Capitol Hill, but based on their previous reputation. And so I think that whether it is synchronous influence peddling while you're in office or asynchronous, setting up, 
your future bankroll uh, and, and making sure that you go to a consulting company, this is really how the game is run. And, and in a certain sense, I wonder, and I, I wonder if the professor could answer, is like, is there a way, is it just about continuing to create new laws and knowing that they'll eventually be circumvented or what's the best, what seems to work? Professor, you hear the question? I did, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, essentially, does this latest Clinton revelation invite us to <clears throat> add to the set of ethics standards that we have? Do we need more regulation? Um, as someone who has been studying this, this area of law for about 20 years, I, I'm not convinced that this is an area where we actually need more regulation. Um, I believe that the Clintons, are, or Secretary Clinton in particular, is paying a kind of political price for the decisions that she made regarding the foundation. Um, and I think that there's a place for uh, acknowledging <clears throat> that we don't need the law to address absolutely everything, since mm -hmm. in the past we've sometimes imposed overly stringent ethics laws um, in, in, instead of uh, keeping, them, uh, sort of keeping them more narrow in scope. How about Trump in this regard, Professor, and the ties that he has through business relationships and through debts that he incurs? Well, one of the things to keep in mind as we think about either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump becoming president um, is that the financial conflict standards that we impose on just about all other employees of the executive branch don't actually apply to the president or the vice president. Again, they those individuals may pay a political price if they are perceived to be acting in ways that benefit them or their families financially, but they don't actually, they, they will not pay any kind of legal price for that. Any, they don't, won't encounter legal liability. We just have 30 seconds left. Annie, there's more revelation to come of some kind uh, from a whole new trove of thousands of Clinton emails, right? That's right, there's like some 15,000 emails that were recovered that now the State Department has to go through to see are these overlaps of what she turned over, is this new stuff we haven't seen. But you know, I've talked to Clinton people who think this process is so tedious, it's more likely that these come out, they could come out as early as October, it's more likely that they'll like affect her re-election bid in 2020 than this <laughs> time because it just takes so long. More gray zone <laughs> yep. for us to wallow in. Thank you all very much for joining Thanks, us. And that's POTUS 2016 for today. We're here each week at this hour calling the presidential horse race and pouring cold hard facts on the overheated campaign rhetoric. Labor Day's coming up. You know, it's the Sunday night of the whole year. Back to the grind and the nine-week home stretch to Election Day. Hang in there. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.